you'll be listening to some wonderful teaching and preaching by pastors that I view as being cut from the same cloth as the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist. So we're examining the life and the ministry of William Williams of Pantakelly. And we're principally looking at a biography called Bread of Life by um, F. N. Evans, a wonderful Christian author on the subject of Welsh revivals, also wrote a great biography on Daniel Rowland. And what I want to do in this clip is bring to life the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, Pastor Sinclair Ferguson, Pastor Begg, uh, Jonathan, Pastor Jonathan and Andy Prime, or Pastor Derek Prime, who's with the Lord, viewed themselves as Welsh Calvinistic Methodists. But what I'm suggesting is that they are cut from the same cloth, that these Welsh Calvinistic Methodists of the 18th century preached a Christ so well and glorified and honor our Lord, preached Christ and him crucified. So we can speak about these things, right, by reading their biographies. And I can share with you how the revivals of the 18th century weren't surely enthusiasm or emotionalism. No, the Lord was bringing about a real change in people that the Welsh Calvinistic Methodists weren't simply making converts, but making disciples through the preaching and teaching their society meetings and their prayer meetings. They were bringing everything to bear to bring about true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ by helping people fall in love with the Lord. And they were genuinely changed people. They were once in Satan's kingdom and now they're in God's kingdom. And so by um, looking at the clips that I'm gonna share with you momentarily, it will, um, illuminate uh, Welsh Calvinistic Methodist principles. Now, again, I want to say this. I can look at other denominations throughout church history and show the exact same thing because ultimately it's going back to Acts, right? And so, I, I, again, I just want to highlight this. In other words, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, during the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, Pastor Sinclair Ferguson was preaching at a Reformed Baptist church. So I drove with a friend probably three hours to get there just to hear him preach. But also Mark Johnson, which I didn't know, also preached that night. And Mark Johnson, I believe he's a Welshman. I know he ministers in Wales, and he's part of the Banner of Truth team. And when he got done preaching, I went up to him and I, because I had one of his books, and I asked him to sign it and I said, sir, uh, after thanking him for the sermon, I said, sir, you really are a Welsh Calvinistic Methodist. And he said, thank you so much. I mean, he really liked that compliment. So, um, so that's what I want to, that's what we're going to do this week. Now, a couple things I want to bring to your attention. If you look up at the screen, don't forget to look at community tab because the community tab will give you wonderful references to what, to other teachings. And so when you're looking for something, I want to encourage you um, to scroll down this page. Now, one, what I want to bring to your attention is this breakout session of Jonathan and Andy Prime. Um, Jonathan is the son of Derek Prime and Andy is the grandson of Derek Prime. And Reverend Derek Prime is the minister who mentored Pastor Alistair Begg. So if you want to understand Pastor Alistair Begg, as an example, then, then you need to know Pastor Derek Prime. If you want to know why does Pastor Begg preach with such power and unction and such illumination? Well, I would suggest a lot of it to you. He learned it for Pastor Derek Prime. Just like I was making the point with Pastor uh, Tim Keller, who was highly influenced by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And people were criticizing Tim Keller for being too winsome, but I go, no, I remember Pastor Keller being tough as well when he needed to be. But he was following the same cloth, if you will, of a Martin Lloyd-Jones. And so I gave you a video of the doctor being interviewed where he was winsome, he was tough, he was dogmatic, all right? So what I'm trying to say is there are those Christians out there saying, Oh, you're being too winsome. We're beyond winsome. We need to get in. We need to be more confrontational. And can I tell you something? I agree with that. In other words, as Christians, we need to speak up. All right. 
that this world has shut us down and we need to speak up about our faith in public places and not be ashamed of the gospel. Okay, so I agree with that. All I'm trying to say is we need to be tough, we need to be winsome, everything needs to be done in love. We need to understand, we need to be able to like be good doctors and diagnose somebody's um, uh, spiritual state before you could understand what they truly need at that time. All right, so um, anyway, but so I wanted to give you this wonderful breakout session of Jonathan and Andy Prime speaking about uh, Reverend Derek Prime, and you'll, it'll be very illuminating if you watch the whole thing. The other thing I want to bring to your attention, if I click here on videos and I go popular, the most popular message in the top four is what I was saying was, you know, very sad for us, disappointed in us, not Pastor Alistair Begg, regarding the controversy where he gave advice to a grandmother um, that shocked people. And it surprised me as well, which is that, um, that this grandmother uh, very well could be in God's will by attending her grandson or grandchild, I don't know if it's a son or daughter, but grandchild's same-sex wedding. And what the grandmother did was she brought the child a Bible. So the point that I was making was that that was a subversive act. And we see these subversive acts where Christians are turning the world upside down or right side up throughout all the scriptures. So like when William Williams is preaching in bars, as an example, during his time of the 18th century, well, that's not exactly where you expect to find a preacher, is it? Right. Or when I shared my story of two people that I love very much, I drove over 3,000 miles. I went to clubs, casinos, bars, um, even what I would view as a drug house. Um, why? Because I found I was looking for my lost sheep, meaning I had two family members I love very much and I, I, and I did not want Satan to win in their lives and I wanted to pull them out. So as Christians, we might find ourselves in very uh, peculiar, unexpected uh, situations. So my, because I went into clubs and casinos and I was there, I mean, oh my goodness, I spent three or four days searching for a loved one and um, to two or three in the morning sometimes. And uh, what, what, I, what I encourage other Christians to go into those places, well, no, no, but I was going into those places to get somebody out of those places. It's like a brother said to me, you know, when I when he heard my messages, these like three messages where it was the initial message because it just wouldn't go away, the controversy that is, and people were wild speculation, and this is the first domino to follow, fall in Pastor Big's ministry, and which of course hasn't happened, um, and and I don't think it ever will happen, because again, of the of the men that God used to to fashion uh, Pastor Big. Um, the um, uh, and then there are another message on you know trying to make it a little bit more clear and then lessons learned, and and I read the you know the snarky comments and some some cruel comments as well, but I just didn't feel a need to defend myself. I'm just I'm just I don't want to do that. But but the point that I was making was that Pastor Big's advice very well could have been sound because it's subversive, and if it wasn't sound, if he was wrong, he had elders, family. And I made the point, Pastor Sinclair Ferguson would be the person who could discuss this with that Pastor Beg if he's wrong. In other words, we didn't need to pile on on YouTube. We didn't need to, all this conflict, everything doesn't have to be dealt with publicly. Um, you know, like, and then, oh, he didn't go to John MacArthur's conference and, and a Christian radio, I think took him off, took him off over 500 radio stations. So that was just a complete overreaction. What I also didn't care for, and I listened to Pastor Beg's response like twice, you know, like the, oh, you know, that he refuses to repent and pr spiritual pride, and and there were other accusations, wild accusations against Pastor Beg, which I, obviously I didn't care for at all. So part of this message, the second part of it is you're going to see now. Um, behind the scenes, if you will, what is Pastor Big's deep secret, which is no secret at all, which is who are the men that have fashioned him as a minister, who God used as a preacher, and which then gives me confidence why he's going to finish his race incredibly well. And so again, I'm not disappointed in Pastor Big. 
but I'm very disappointed in us. And I hope as particularly as Americans that we learn something from this. Because the other thing too, and the reason I'm mentioning this, and again, I, know, I understand I'm weaving multiple things together, um, that Pastor Big said, I, I'm not cut of this American evangelicalism or fundamentalism. I've been fashioned by other people like a Derek Prime and Alec, uh, Eric Alexandria, Alexander um, and uh, um, uh, a John Stodd, a Martin Lloyd-Jones, a Sinclair Ferguson. So you're going to get a taste of what that, of what he's referring to, Th this contrast, um, because in, in America, um, and I'm not saying all ministers are all the time, but we, we tend to almost look at the Bible as, as if it's a, you know, you know, here are the 10 ways to make your life better, or, you know, or, or there's, you know, pursuing sound doctrine, but yet not really seeing the person of Jesus Christ. Um, so like many times, and you'll hear Pastor Derek Thomas speak about this, we can go to a service and it can be completely orthodox, completely true, but really nothing to do with Jesus. And so when you look at the Bible and you hear and you read for yourself what these men are saying, they're always referring to themselves, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I belong to Christ. I am in Christ. In other words, these men in the New Testament are never moving on beyond Christ. They're always pointing to Christ. You know, uh, J James never says about himself, well, you know, Jesus was pretty good, but he's dead now and I'm taking over. No, no, they're speaking about the resurrected Jesus, the one who is sitting on the throne at this very moment, who has, our, our times are in his hands. He is governing this world. So, um, so Christ is exalted. And so what I'm suggesting that we can learn as Americans is to exalt Jesus better. So I'm not trying to slam anybody. And the other thing too is, um, I don't know if I've mentioned this already. Please forgive me if I'm repeating myself. But again, is it time for Christians to speak up? Yes. But we speak up because we know our Bibles well. Is it time to be winsome? Yes. Is it time to be firm? Yes. Is it time to confront? Yes. It really is. This world is really lost. And it seems like it's getting darker and darker by the day. You know, like when... Um, I'm trying to remember now which Calvinistic method has said this, but I think, well, it was William Williams, right? This is the darkest hour, you know. Oh, my goodness. Here we are in year 2024 in America, and it's really dark. So, um, so but conflict sells. So as you look at this screen, what you'll see is the, the messages that have been most popular are the 5,000 for my first message and then 3,000 for lessons learned, and then, um, then a, a third message a third message on just trying to clarify what I was saying. Well, what I want you to know is I'm going to be removing those three messages, not because I'm ashamed of them. I still stand with them. There's been no conviction as I'm reading the scriptures. There's nothing that stands out that, that says that um, I, there's anything I need to repent of or, or anything of that nature. There's, there's nothing to that. But this channel, like, when the controversy came about, I was like 250 and I was expecting to lose people, like go down to 125 maybe. And, and said it actually went up. We're close to like 500 now, which I find remarkable. But that's not what this channel is about. Um, so I really don't want to get into conflict, right? Because it's, it's almost like clickbaiting, right? Like how do I grow this channel? No, no. This channel is about me helping you get to heaven and you help me get to heaven. If we're, if we're in Christ together then you're helping me and I'm helping you. And this channel is about really Psalm 77. We're beginning with verse 11, where what I'm saying is, oh, we're lost, we're confused. There's a lot of darkness. So let's go back. Let's go back to our Bibles. And Pastor Derek Prime is going to give us the questions that we should be asking ourselves as we're exploring the Bible, by the way. But let's go back. Let's not try new things, but let's go back. And so you can say, well, John, but is that biblical? Is that biblical? Well, yes, go to Psalm 77, begin with verse 11, where the psalmist is crying out to the Lord, 
crying out to the Lord. The psalmist really sounds like he's in desperation. And what begins to lead him out of the darkness is, is, is this solution, verse 11. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders, and you made known your might among the peoples. With you, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. And likewise, that should be our hearts, that we just should have like a concert of prayer for revival. Let's commit to ourselves at least once a week to be quiet for 15 or 30 or 45 minutes and just seek the Lord through prayer and reading that God would rend the heavens and come down and visit us again. So I know this might sound a little bit complicated, but that those are my two overarching things. I want to make the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist come alive to you. And I'm going to give you examples of that now. What I also wanted to do was um, uh, uh, speak about this issue about um, about who fashioned Pastor Beg and why do I have confidence that he will finish his ministry? He started it strong. He's been strong in the middle, and indeed he will run his race to the very end. And my confidence is quite high um, that indeed will happen. And um, and that also too is that I just want to emphasize this channel is about going back, back to the simplicity of the scriptures that Christ would be exalted in our lives. And yes, these are very dark times, but there are solutions. And these ministers are going to give you solutions. Well, until next time, grace be with you all. Well, good evening, good evening, good evening. Well, what a wonderful day it's been so far. And um, thank you for your participation in all the different parts and pieces. I uh, had the chance just to wander around a little bit, meet different ones. And um, it's a, just a great encouragement to be in the company of one another. We thank you for uh, coming. I was able to participate in one of the breakout sessions and uh, I know that uh, others of you have been in different places and so we're, we're glad of all that has gone on and if you missed one today then I think you can get it tomorrow and uh, the same the same for me. The reason I'm up here now is just because in a moment or two after we've sung a couple of songs I have the privilege of introducing uh, my dear friend uh, Sinclair Ferguson I'm not sure he likes this, but I tell people everywhere I go that he's actually my big brother. Um, he's, the, he's the brother that I've never had. I never had a brother. I have two sisters. But I did think if I had a brother, I would like my brother to be like Sinclair. And uh, so he couldn't be like Sinclair because he is Sinclair. And so, and, and Sinclair is actually like Sinclair. I've known him for quite a long time. Um, 
He's a little senior to me, um, but um, uh, so important to me. People ask all the time, who do you listen to? Who do you refer to? Who do you call out to when um, you're looking for help and encouragement? And um, Sinclair is right up there. He doesn't need introductions in terms of his background or what he's done, what he's written, who he is. He's a friend to us here at Parkside Church. He's been very gracious in coming on each occasion that we've invited him. And uh, so in a moment or two, he'll preach. Uh, but let me pray and then uh, we'll sing together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we're able to come to you boldly to come before a throne of grace where we find uh, mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And sometimes we're peculiar aware of a sense of need, whatever that might be. And that may be the case for some of us tonight that in our heart of hearts, we are longing and hoping to hear from you as we listen to your word opened up. Thank you for the way that you come graciously to sometimes just tap us on the shoulder or um, speak to us uh, in the quietest of tones, not in a vast noise sometimes, and just in a stillness. We pray for a sense of stillness as we listen to uh, the word opened up to us tonight. We pray for Sinclair that he might have joy and freedom in doing what you've gifted him to do and that each of us will have uh, eager, keen, receptive hearts so that we might increasingly be fashioned in the likeness of the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. That was spoken like a real Presbyterian. <laughs> well, obviously, it's uh, a great privilege to be at Basics again. Um, it would be a greater delight, probably, to be sitting where you're sitting rather than standing where I'm standing, but it is an enormous privilege uh, to be able to have the opportunity of ministering God's word uh, to us as we sit together under it. And it's, it's very nice to be in my wee brother's congregation. <laughs> uh, Alistair knows that uh, he had no brother and found one, and I had a brother I lost many years ago, and found another brother. And this uh, blessing of being in the family of God in general, which I'm convinced is the basic New Testament picture of the church. All the other pictures are pictures. Uh, we are not brides, and we are not bodies. And we're not literally temples, but we are quite literally, as well as spiritually, the family of God. And to have this brotherhood in the work of the gospel ministry, and to be able to be together, is a, a priceless privilege. Now you will think, those of you who have malicious minds, that Scottish people do things backwards. And that will be confirmed when I ask you to turn again in your Bibles to Paul's second letter to Timothy. <laughs> but on this occasion, not to chapter 4, uh, but to chapter 1. And as you do that, let me try and say a few words by way of introduction as to what I plan to do as we're together for these three sessions for which I have the responsibility. Alistair gave me free reign um, which, as many of you know, is often more difficult than being told what to do. And what I have uh, set my heart on doing is a series of three studies or messages or addresses on the overall theme of the holy ministry. And under that 
overall theme, I want to try and cover three topics out of a vast range of topics that would fit under it. The first is appreciating our holy calling. The second is developing holy affections. And the third is proclaiming the holy redeemer. And I've rather deliberately chosen that word holy, not only for the overall title, but to insert it into each of the titles for a very specific reason. It is rather old language to speak about us being in the holy ministry. And we have developed all kinds of other descriptions, self-descriptions of who we are and what we do as pastors. And it's probably largely accidental, but I think it's not altogether insignificant that that has happened when a premium on the holiness of ministers of the gospel has gone into decline. And I think we see it in very obvious ways. Um, you will see it almost certainly on the bookshelves in your study that contain the books you have on the ministry. That from the modern period, many of them will concentrate on the nuts and bolts of ministry. A large number, an extraordinarily increasing number, are written on the centrality of preaching in the ministry. But I'm pretty certain I can wager you will find relatively few books on the absolute necessity of holiness in the ministry. And yet, as I think we understand, this is why we are at basics, that holiness in the ministry is absolutely essential. I watched him die on WhatsApp, on a WhatsApp call. And as he died and Andy's dad sat next to him and I was on the call, I quoted how sweet the name of Jesus sounds to him. Because that was what he was about. And his life was genuinely a walk with his saviour. Um, each morning, he'd get up, he'd have his breakfast, he'd have a shower, he'd make the most enormous cup of coffee. And then, in his words, he would be quiet. So I'd maybe phone him and he'd say, I'm just about to be quiet, son. What did that mean? For him, it was a conversation with the Lord Jesus listening to him from his word, responding in prayer. He was an avid Robert Murray McShane, Bible plan man. And he consistently did what he suggested to the congregation of Charlotte Chapel we should do. He said, you read your Bible, and as you read in the morning, it's not a Bible study, read it saying, Lord, give me something for today. And so invariably he'd jot down a thought or he'd jot down a verse He'd chew it over, he'd respond in prayer. The very fact of writing it down, initially it was a notebook, latterly when his writing was bad, he used an iPad. And he'd often then print off that verse from the Bible, have it in his pocket and give it to people as he met them throughout the day. Uh, that was his life. Mm. And what was true of him personally was very true for him when it came to preaching and teaching. When he retired, he still had loads of opportunities to speak to different people all over the world. But when he was presented with an opportunity to speak to pastors and pastor teachers, invariably he would go and preach on the centrality of Christ and him crucified. And he used to keep all of his sermons um, from his file facts notes and put them in little brown envelopes like this, um, the insane organisation. And when he passed away, um, I went to his house, found the cabinets that these were kind of laden with. And before Johnny could get there, I stole all the sermons on preaching, pastoring and the pastoral epistles. Um, and on every uh, notebook or all these kind of envelopes is written the dates and the places where he preached them. And the one for or the pastorals and the kind of pastoring and preaching ones that I took, the one that's got the most writing on it is called Preaching the Cross. Uh, and interestingly, the first time he preached it was the 13th of the 9th, 1996, 
Parkside Church, Cleveland, Ohio, USA. So here he is preaching on the centrality of Christ and him crucified. It's got a lovely message in it which says, the essence of the cross is the essence of the gospel message. Without the cross, there is no good news. And he says simply, what the cross is to us, the Lord Jesus is to us. But the repeats on this envelope shows you that Um, The kind of resolution of his retirement when he was speaking to pastors and teachers was to ensure that they preached the whole Christ from the whole of the scriptures. And that came from his own understanding of himself as a a saved sinner who found the the name of Jesus incessantly sweet to him. I I vividly remember when I was um, serving as an associate pastor at Charlotte Chapel, sitting with granddad listening to a visiting preacher preach from the book of Daniel and granddad's heart was always to encourage and he demonstrated that when even listening to bad preaching his instinct was that the mature believer should be easily edified so he was always looking for good things but when we walked back to my car to give my lift home I could tell he was bothered as I said come on out with it what's up and he simply said to me there was nothing of Jesus in that sermon And his love for Christ just left him always with a longing to hear of Christ in every single sermon. Now, you think that in part came from a little bit of a telling off from Granny? Yeah, well, I I think um, this was definitely a conviction that he shared with my mother. My my mother was a very quiet person. Um, She hardly ever said anything to Dad in front of us about his preaching. But I do remember a Sunday lunchtime when I think I was about 10 or 11 years old. And at the dinner table, Sunday lunchtime, she simply looked up and said, Derek, you didn't mention Jesus in your sermon today. It was a series on the life of Abraham. Uh, I have all his sermons, apart from the ones Andy's nicked, going right back to the 1950s. And it's interesting, I have read some of the older ones, and I'm not sure that conviction was as substantial in his thinking then, in the 50s, as it then became. Which actually should encourage us that actually our convictions will change and grow, but actually his conviction, which my children know I share, is that we should be preaching Jesus all the time. Mm. Mm. Every page of scripture is designed to point us to him. And my kids, um, when we've been on holiday and we visit churches, there have been a few occasions where they've come out and they said, Daddy, you're not happy, are you? Jesus wasn't mentioned. The cross wasn't mentioned. Daddy, we're sorry. And, and that all comes from this pattern. Uh, Dad loved, uh, there's a book by J.I. Packer. I don't know what it's called. It changed its name. It was originally called Among God's Giants. It gives six questions that the Puritans would ask of any passage of scripture. And the middle one was, how does this relate to the Lord Jesus and his work of redemption? And dad said, that's the question the devil doesn't want us to ask. But it's the question every preacher must ask of every passage of scripture. Mm. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the Acts of the Apostles and chapter 19. And while you're turning to it, I want to give you a verse from Proverbs. You may not at first see why I've chosen it, but I hope that by the end you will perhaps see why... It has come to my mind. It's a verse in Proverbs that I read just the other day in my own Bible reading. And uh, it was very significant for me and an encouragement. And it's Proverbs 15 and verse 21, where the writer of Proverbs says, Folly 
delights a man who lacks judgment. But a man of understanding keeps a straight course. A man of understanding keeps a straight course. So if you can hold that verse in your mind, um, I hope that it will be an encouragement as we draw to a close. Now in Acts chapter 19, we're going to begin reading at verse 8. You remember how Paul's arrived in Ephesus and he's met these disciples and he asks, have you received the Holy Spirit? And then he places his hands on them. They were those who'd received John's baptism. And then Luke takes up what happens in Ephesus. Verse 8 of Acts 19. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick. And their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. I don't imagine for a moment this morning that I'm going to be sharing with you anything that is new. Although I'm reminded of Peter's words that we need to be stirred up by way of remembrance. But I think that if anyone asks me, what has influenced you most in your understanding of pastoral ministry and preaching ministry? It will be what I'm wanting to share with you this morning. I want you to have your Bibles open at the Acts of the Apostles. David Livingston, that missionary known to most of us as we've read of his life, said, I am willing to go anywhere so long as it's forward. Now, I don't doubt that that was a right goal for him and indeed for every Christian believer. We cannot doubt this morning that as our Lord Jesus Christ looks upon the world today, those situations where he's placed you and me, that he is moved with compassion at the need of the lost. Where you and I live, there are people like Nicodemus who have perhaps some understanding of religion but not the experience of new birth. There will be many where we live and work who are like the woman of Samaria, satisfying their desires with wrong things, yet really being thirsty for the water of life. And as so soon we separate from one another, I want to remind you and remind myself that the atoning death of our Lord Jesus Christ had their salvation in view as well as ours. 
we were thinking yesterday of the honor of the name of God and of his son, the Lord Jesus. And our concern as we go from here must be the honor of his name and the honor of our Savior. But that means that we have to be involved in reaching men and women with the good news of the Lord Jesus. Now, the early church certainly knew progress. We all know Acts 2 and 47, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And throughout his ministry, the Lord Jesus spoke about those other sheep that had to be brought into the safety of his fold. And if you and I are part of his people today, therefore, we must be concerned for the gathering in of the lost. So what I'm suggesting is that progress in that sense is always to be the concern of the church. And without that concern, churches flounder or they become caught up with activities that in the final analysis are unprofitable. But here's the question I want to ask. What is progress? What do we mean by progress? Do we mean simply numerical growth? I'm sure some of you have asked one another, how large is your church fellowship? Is that spiritual growth? Are we thinking in terms of the number of people reached? The thing that strikes one as you look at the Acts of the Apostles is this. Progress is described carefully and deliberately in the Acts of the Apostles on four occasions. Turn with me to them. I want you to turn the page of your Bible. First of all, Acts chapter 6. You remember the situation? The apostles have got bogged down with administration, always a danger for us. It was hindering them in their prayer and in their ministry of the word. And they take action and it says in verse 7, So the word of God spread goes on, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. But the key sentence is, so the word of God spread. Chapter 12, quite a crisis in the life of the church. Peter is in prison. It looks as if he might follow James, the brother of John, and be put to death with a sword. The early church meets to pray. Verse 24, but the word of God continued to increase and spread. Chapter 13 and verse 49, the word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region. Then finally in Acts 19, where we just read, Paul is in Ephesus. He's been teaching for two years. And it says in verse 20, in this way, that was when the people came and burnt all their scrolls and expressed their repentance. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now, this is the thing we must take note of. That's the only way Luke describes progress. That's the only way Luke describes progress in terms of the multiplication and the spread of the word of God. So fundamental to our thinking, therefore, must be a definition of the word of God or the word of the Lord. Now, the Greek word here as elsewhere is logos. It's the word that John uses in John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But the word elsewhere can simply mean the message. But its distinctive use in the Bible, and in the New Testament in particular, is that it describes the message of God, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the revelation of God in his Son, given us in his written word and for us in the Old and New Testaments. Turn to Acts 6 again in verse 7. 
Notice what it says in Acts 6 and verse 7. So the word of God spread. Well, what does that mean? Well, look back to verse 2. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. What was that ministry of the word? Well, it was that word that Peter had preached on the day of Pentecost. When he proclaimed the Lord Jesus and the message of salvation using the Old Testament scriptures. So what are we to understand? Well, that word, the word of God, is the message of God given to us in his word. It's very interesting that the word is sometimes used just on its own. But there are another, a number of other ways. It is the word of God. It is the word of Christ sometimes. It is the word of the cross. It is the word of reconciliation. And it is the word of life. And if you just ponder those, I've had time to do it. And you're having to do it very quickly. But it indicates that the word, the message, is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is proclaimed as the testimony of the scriptures is taught. So, progress in the New Testament is not described in terms of Christianity growing, or of the gospel even growing, or of the church growing. And yet, clearly, when the word grows, the church grows, Christianity spreads, and the gospel is preached. Why did Luke, obviously inspired by the Holy Spirit, but why did Luke use this description? I would suggest it's for one very simple reason. Turn with me to Luke's gospel. You know this well, but it's worth turning to it. Luke 8, you could find it also in Matthew and in Mark. But in Luke 8 and verse 5, Luke records this parable of Jesus. And I'm going to emphasize particular parts of it. You'll notice as I read it. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 11, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word, the seed, from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear as they go on their way. They are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Surely that must be why Luke uses this description. And as far as we're told in the Gospels, this was the first parable the Lord Jesus taught. And it set the pattern and the direction and the emphasis of his own ministry. He went about teaching. That was the most important ministry that he had before his cross. So it's worthy of our thought this morning, in some depth perhaps, because God does not change. His methods do not alter. And it's entirely right that as a company of men this morning, as we go back 
to those situations in which God has put us that we long for progress. We long to see things happen for the honor of God and of our Savior. So let me ask this question. Why is progress described in this way in the New Testament? And I think it's described in this way because the Word of God is always the means by which we are to test every expression of Christianity and every proclamation of the gospel. They are both subject to the word of God. I hadn't picked up until I just read the scriptures now publicly that word noble. Those with a noble and good heart. And I'm not sure whether it's the same word in the Greek as you have in the Acts when it describes the Bereans. You remember the Bereans? They were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. For they received the message, the word, with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And that word noble there in the Acts means well-pleasing. But well-pleasing to whom? Well-pleasing to God. The uniqueness of the Bible is that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. Now, that cannot always be said of Christianity, can it? There are many leaders in the visible church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when they speak, sadly, we cannot say that God always speaks. And there are many who say they preach the gospel. But there are other gospels, false gospels. Christianity, therefore, in the different ways in which it expresses itself, is subject to God's word, to what God has revealed in the scriptures. And the test of the genuineness of anything that professes to be Christian is its conformity to the word of God. Now, the Lord Jesus, not in this same context, but himself practiced this principle as he tested what the Jewish leaders and others taught. Do you remember when the chief priests and elders challenged his authority? He told them the parable of the tenants and of the vineyard. And he concluded by saying to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. And almost immediately afterwards, he's dealing with the Sadducees. And they're trying to trip him up about the resurrection. And his response was, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. I'm interested that those two things go together. And then he talked about how the resurrection, we're neither married, we'll be like the angels in heaven. And then he said, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Oh, one final illustration, the loveliest of all. The disciples on that resurrection day, walking on the road to Emmaus. And what he was teaching them was how they were always to be assured of the truth. Ought not the Christ to have suffered and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As I finished looking at this passage, I found myself thinking what a privilege it is to have the, the scriptures in my own language. And how great my assurance should be in believing the word of God and obeying it. How unashamed I should be of being what others may call me, an evangelical Christian, a gospel Christian. 
Why, what greater privilege than to share the salvation and grace that are ours in Jesus Christ. And what confidence I should have in using this sword. Now what I want to do in just my final moments is to apply this to us as pastors and teachers. And I'd want first for us just to underline it's were in our minds. This description of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ. I want it to be in my mind. There's a hymn that we sometimes sing in the UK. Um, it's entitled Spirit of Holiness. And it has these very simple words. You came to interpret and teach us effectively all that the Savior has spoken and done to glorify Jesus is all your activity, promise and gift of the Father and Son. Do not forget that. And then secondly, I've been greatly helped over the years by a list of questions that the Puritans used to ask of any scripture passage. Alistair spoke very helpfully yesterday um, of thinking ourselves empty was his expression. That is, you... You just, without trying to deal with the passage and how you're going to preach on it, you just put down everything that comes to your mind and scriptures and references and illustrations. And I would like to share these questions. I remember I shared them with some of you three years ago. But I want to lay emphasis on what I think is the most important. But let me just share them with you. The first question you ask of any passage is, what do the words actually mean? So you'd be wanting in the case here to be looking at grace or salvation or predicted or signified. But what do the words, start with that. Now sometimes that's very straightforward. doesn't take a moment because you're familiar. Sometimes you may need to use whatever equipment you have to look up the real meaning of the words. The second question is, what light do other parts of the Bible throw upon this part? Alistair was doing that when he went back to the invitation given by the tax collector to people to come to his home. What like do other parts of the scripture? That's very important because then you will not deal with the passage in a way that is inconsistent or unhelpful. The third question is where and how does what this part declares fit into the complete revelation God gives us in the Bible on this subject? And that's very helpful because other scriptures will come to mind because the best interpreter of scripture is not your commentary, but the Bible itself. And that's always a safeguard. The fourth question is, what does it teach about God? And as you think of the Luke 15, the running God, the God who kisses the returning sinner. But then there comes another question. What does it teach about men and women in their relationship to God? Now, immediately that throws light in Luke 15, doesn't it? We're rebels, turned our back upon what is best for us and what we were made for. But then we come to what I feel is the most important question in the light of what Peter says. And it worries me that it's a question that is not always asked. Here it is. What relationship do these words have to the saving work of our Lord Jesus Christ? And what light does the gospel as a whole throw upon them? Now, I believe that is the most important question to ask if we're faithful to 1 Peter 10 to 12. But let me explain what I mean. I remember being in church earlier this year and feeling we were in the Old Testament and I don't mean it unkindly to the preacher, but I came away feeling, you know, 
that message could have been given in a Jewish synagogue today. It was utterly orthodox, an exposition of the passage, but it was not related at all to the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't mean to say that we should do this artificially. Often there may be an immediate and obvious link to the person and work of our Lord Jesus. That was true in Luke 15. The link may be one of anticipation. You may be dealing with the Exodus, but you can't talk about the Exodus without talking about the Lord Jesus as our Passover lamb. It may be that you're talking about the Levitical offerings, but you can't talk about the offerings without going to the cross and the need for propitiation. The link may sometimes be our Saviour's example. I was asked a little while ago to speak on friendship. Well, the obvious thing to do uh, was to go to David and Jonathan. And so I spoke about David and Jonathan. But I couldn't talk about friendship without the words of the Lord Jesus. You are my friends if you do what I command you. The link may sometimes be the impossibility of some things achievement. So that if you talk about holiness in the Old Testament, you have to explain to those who are there, who are listening to you, that holiness, acceptance with God is only possible through the atoning work of Christ. I can't think of anything that I've ever preached on that will not have some natural, without being artificial or manipulating, that has led me in some way to Christ. And our people are not fed unless they realize his centrality. Question number seven. What experiences do these words outline or explain or try to create or cure? Well, you automatically have an answer if you're looking at Luke 15, whether at the younger son or the older son. Verse 8, not verse 8, question 8. What was the application of these words to the people at the time? Well, there were the Pharisees there, and as Alistair reminded us, There were the tax collectors and the prostitutes. And then the ninth question. How do these words apply to us now? Well, Alistair was doing that this morning. And finally, what are we told either to believe or to do? I find it's helpful even to have these questions on your desk. I always regret it if I have to prepare and it happens sometimes without having time to go through them all. But frankly, if you empty yourself on your piece of paper, you probably have more than you'll find in any commentary that you read. Now, the third thing I want to say, oh, let me just go back to number six. That, I believe, is the question that so often is missed. Now, the third thing is that there are lessons, I think, here for our teaching and preaching. I'm sorry if I appear to now be underlining something you know. But we must recognize that our message, and that's come out this morning already, is one of salvation and salvation through grace. And you must never forget, I must never forget, that the end of a sermon, the purpose, is the salvation of our hearers. We've been hearing about Whitfield, and uh, we've heard about the Wesleys. A man who lived at the time was a man called William Grimshaw, and he was quite a character. He lived in a place called Haworth in Yorkshire. He had a very significant ministry. And it was a day of controversies, those controversies that were mentioned with regard to Whitfield. And Grimshaw avoided dealing in his sermons with doctrinal differences. He rather wanted to 
emphasize the things that unite believers. And this is what he said. Let us take care to preach up Jesus and him crucified. He said that was his objective. And then he said this on another occasion. My business is to invite all to come to Christ for salvation and to assure all that will come of a hearty welcome. Invite all to salvation and assure them of a hearty welcome. Do you sense in there what I did? That there's a danger that you can preach the gospel coldly. And here's Grimshaw say, I want everyone to know that there's a hearty welcome. If like the son in that parable, they make their way back to God. Can I ask you, and I ask it of myself, am I regularly explaining, illustrating, unpacking what salvation means? Could every member of your congregation, having listened to you, explain what salvation means? And are we making people wonder at the grace of God? I thought of something just yesterday as I was thinking of today that I haven't remembered for years. And I only wish it had happened to me more than just this once, although I'm sure it did without my knowing. But I was a pastor in London for 12 years. And like many pastors, particularly if it's not a a very large church, I was normally the last person to leave the church. Sometimes even had to lock the door. Um, And one Sunday morning, just about to go home for lunch, and uh, a young fellow comes. His name was Tony. I saw him again about 10 years ago. And uh, came on his bike. And I was just locking, I think I had locked the door, and I was just about to set off for home. And I said, what is it, Tony? Have you left something? He said, no, Pastor. But I just wanted to say, isn't the Lord wonderful? Isn't that how we would want our people to go home Sunday by Sunday? Isn't the Lord wonderful? Our study of the scriptures, too, must have the same focus as the prophets on proclaiming the person and work of Christ, that is, that he is the Christ, his sufferings, and his glory, and the two twin themes of salvation and grace. And we must diligently search the scriptures just as they did. And the thought that came to me, and I I hope it makes sense to you, it, it does to me. It was as the prophets searched diligently, thought over what God had revealed to them, that they felt they had to speak. Have you ever come to a Sunday reluctantly? Are you even thinking of going back home today and thinking, oh, I've got a Sunday to prepare for? It was as they searched diligently, as they understood, grasped more and more of this wonderful mystery that is something God was revealing to them, that they had to speak. Oh, that's how I want to be every Sunday. The Holy Spirit delights to add his own authority to his word as it's proclaimed. And it's not insignificant, as we've said already, that in the Acts, whenever the the believers wanted boldness to proclaim the gospel without asking for being filled with the Spirit, as in Acts 4, when they asked for boldness, the answer was they were filled with the Spirit and they spoke the word with boldness. Paul says, when I came to you at Corinth, I didn't come with eloquence, superior wisdom, I proclaim to you the testimony about God. What was the testimony about God? What God has revealed. I determined to know nothing among you 
Say, Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came in weakness and fear with much trembling. My message and preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. As we go from this place this afternoon, let's remember our dependence upon the Holy Spirit. I often find myself saying, as I go up into a pulpit, I believe in God, the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a final reference to McChain and I finish. I'm, I'm quite delighted that there's been a special delivery at McChain for today. When people found his notes, and lots of his sermon notes are in Edinburgh in the New College Library. Um, but at the end of lots of his notes, there were found little notes. Let me just mention three of them. In other words, so that when he read through his notes before preaching, he had written a little note to himself. Oh, life of the world, help me. Another note. Own thine own truth to the conversion of sinners and comfort of the saints. A third note, out of weakness, make me strong, send showers of the Spirit. Often of a Saturday afternoon, McChain would go and visit those in his congregation who were terminally ill, that he might not forget on Sunday that he was preaching to dying men and women. My final word, almost. In view of 1 Peter 1.12, I believe that the angels envy us our privilege. If they desire to look into things, I wonder what they're saying about this conference. They must feel, as Isaac Watts puts it, come let us join our cheerful songs with angels round the throne. Ten thousand thousand are their tongue, but all their joys are one. Worthy the lamb that died, they cry, to be exalted thus. Worthy the lamb, our lips reply, for he was slain for us. Go away with a sense of privilege. Did you come discouraged? Have you been seeking a change of sphere of ministry? That may be right. But set before you your priceless privilege. I don't say it lightly, and it's perhaps a silly thing to say. But if I could start all over again, I would love to. What a privilege to be a minister of the gospel. So let me sum up. This conference is entitled Being a Pastor. In the light of Ephesians 6, what do we say? Well, being a pastor means wearing the whole armor of God. Not least remembering truth followed by righteousness. And then wearing the armor, taking the weapons, putting them on. Put them on before you go home today. The weapon of prayer sword of the spirit being a pastor James 4 means taking care of your own soul of being watchful against backsliding encouraging your flock to do the same and if any have backslid go after them take them to the scriptures and point them to the one who gives more grace being a pastor one peter means maintaining in all your teaching and preaching the centrality of christ's sufferings and glory and the wonders of salvation and grace and making sure that those are central not only in your teaching and preaching 
but all those who share it with you, whether it is among the children or the young people or your associates, that you keep everyone focused on our Lord Jesus Christ. A prayer together. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, it's so easy to talk and not to do. It's so easy to listen and not to be a doer of the word. But our prayer now is that everything that has been said in this whole conference, morning, afternoon and evening, that whatever is of your spirit, you will write it on our hearts and cause it to be lived out in our lives to the end that our Lord Jesus Christ may have his rightful place in our lives, in our service, and in your great mercy, in the lives of many, many others, for his name's sake. Amen.